for uh, get ready. There, we're gonna go through this one pretty quick. This is a pretty cool uh, presentation I put together. Uh, you guys are gonna feel like this is old hat, but you're gonna learn stuff in here that you didn't know before. Starting and charging stuff that systems that are on every car. Batteries though can short out without warning and go boom. Everybody feels like that's not going to happen to me, but if you start thinking that way, it's like playing Russian roulette with a big gun. Okay, so don't go there. All right, this is a car battery. It's a set of plates. Each cell of the lead storage battery has alternate plates of lead, cathode, lead coated with lead dots. I drew this myself on paint, so you should be really happy with my artwork. You will not see a picture like this anywhere on the internet unless you see it on one of my videos. All right. The battery is filled with a sulfuric acid solution. Now, what are the little uh, batteries that you buy at the store filled with? Yes. An alkaline solution, which is the other side of acid. So water is seven, acid goes down, alkaline goes up. If you're off of balance, you're going to have electro... electro we'll buy a lithium-ion battery. Lithium-ion batteries are basically, it's got to be a balance whether it's acid. I don't know if lithium-ion, I think that's an alkaline type battery too. I may be wrong about that, so don't quote me on that. When the battery is charged, all the electrons are trapped on the anode side of each cell and are constantly looking for a path to the cathode side, and that's according to electron theory. Before you do any troubleshooting on a starting or charging system, make sure the battery and all the connections are good, but you may ch or you may change parts that aren't bad. <coughs> hey, there she is. What you got there? Oh, the caliper. Okay, wow. You got a spark plug? Yeah. Yeah, you got a spark plug and a caliper. Yeah. All right. Go put that spark plug in that truck. Cool. Hurry up! I catch everything. You can watch the video, okay? Okay, let's face it. You make the dog on shirt, you got a good battery. Put that on that desk in there. And uh, here we go. We can disable the fuel and ignition system and spin the starter for 15 seconds while you're watching the battery voltage. It should not go below 9.6 volts. If you got a battery that's healthy enough to start that car, you disable everything so the car won't start, hold the gas pedal to the floor, or whatever, and time it, 15 seconds, watch your voltage. It ought not to go below 9.6, okay? So you got voltage drop here, and you know about voltage drop. Basically, you can look and measure from positive to positive, but you know, somewhere along that line, if there's resistance, you're going to see it go down. Okay, now you got these here starters. I also drew this on paint, so you're not going to see this anywhere. It's just something that I drew, right? Okay, you got a positive brush, you got a negative brush, you got batteries over there, put up your phone, Zane. All right, the current flowing through the brushes and a commutator, and it creates magnetic. See, I took all of this, I rammed it together, I put it in the battery. All right, you got that? Okay, whenever the contact between these two terminals is made by this big ugly washer, if it's resting, it looks like this. If it's spinning, it looks like that. You notice the contact has been made here at the same time, right? This, these two terminals have got to make contact before, I mean, excuse me, only after that gear is in the thermal. This is going to go into the flywheel before this contact is made. I had a starter on my Taurus that acted crazy. It was one that was a rebuilt one I got from Advance. Drove it for several months. One morning I went to get in it and it went, yeah, yeah, as soon as I hit the gas, I mean, as soon as I hit the key, because something was making contact back here beforehand. You see what I'm saying? All right. Battery starters and circuits. you got to learn how your system's wired and how it works. Hold on a minute. I gotta charge out parts before you take that truck, so don't run off on it, okay? I gotta charge out that spark plug. Okay. Learn how your system's wired and how it works. Some of them you notice you got a PC, I'm watching the neutral safety switch, the starter relay, and then you got your hot and start over here. So basically if the PCM doesn't give that starter relay ground, or if because of the passive anti-theft system, or because of the it doesn't see the transmission being in park. There you go. So you got to learn that the older ones basically are going through the manual lever position or the clutch switch or whatever. And then you got your battery right here. So uh, does any theft system affect the starter? You need to know that. Not all any theft fixed and will, systems will affect the starter. Some of them will spin it over, but they won't let it keep running. Like on these Chevys. You know, they'll start and die, start and die, start and die. Okay. Uh, starter interrupt relay. Is there a fuse involved? How is the vehicle equipped? How about aftermarket devices? Without any theft, with any theft. Okay, you spin the starter with the meter set up as shown. Your meter may have uh, a 200, 2,000 millivolt scale, you know, same as 2 volt. Okay, so basically, in other words, if you're on 2,000 millivolt, that's like a 2 volt scale, but it gives you a higher resolution reading, okay? And so you got body ground and transmission housing. You're going to go from there to the body of the starter. You basically would go from the hot side to there. 
Uh, what gets me is I'll have people say, I already know all of that, and then I tell them to do a voltage drop test, they don't know how to do it. I'm trying to run over this with you again. If everything else checks out, but the starter is still less than active or too slow, take the starter off the bench and test it with a good strong battery. You know, that's the starter off at 04, you just hit that one terminal right up there. And I think, I think I've got that where you can see it happen. Maybe not. It's got to load it. There we go. Look at this one. See that? Is that a good starter? It's not, is it? All right. All right, I'm going to go here. Now look at this right here. This was a freshly replaced starter, and she said, uh, I had a starter on my Chrysler, and I had to whack it every time we started the car before it started. It's easy to get to it. And so she says, so we put another starter on the car, and I still have to whack it and replace the starter. And that doesn't mean there was nothing wrong with the first starter. It just means that the second one, and I've talked about this in here before. These little brushes that are on the inside here depend on these screws right here for a ground signal. That particular one, see how it was arcing around that screw? And I've actually seen that on some of the power stroke diesel trucks with them big Mitsubishi aluminum started on them too. And I would take the back off, this, you know, take those screws out, not take the back off, take the screws out, brush that really good, put it back on tight, and now that's all it takes to fix the whole learning problem that they're having, right? So the scorching around the screws got drowned. Okay, now then, the starter drive's got a one-way overrunning clutch, and when it crops out, uh, that's what happened. Now this is a sort of a noisy video. I'm going to see if I can get this one to play right here. Starter drive right here. Starter drive right here. You ever heard one do that? Overrunning clutch is no good. Now that one, see the second time we did it, it caught. All right, but now watch it again. Starter drive right here. See, the starter kept spinning, but the gear stopped because the overrunning clutch, that would be these little, you ever took a Frags of Stratton lawnmower apart and seen the little balls in there? Well, no, you had never done that, y'all. You, you guys didn't grow up like I did. Okay. All right, so the starter drive is a one way overrunning clutch, and the starter, the, the thing that the, the rope hooks to is got an overrunning clutch, but it's not quite this elaborate. It's just got little balls that roll down in little tray, and then when, whenever the mower is running, it basically lets the balls bounce up there and all that. All right, now let me go past that because I'm get past there. All right, an alternator is a robust component that has to operate tirelessly over a wide range of temperatures and RPM ranges just to keep a vehicle moving. They take advantage of induction, which is a term describing the fact that when copper windings sweep through a magnetic field, electrons begin to flow in the windings. And uh, I really had to be careful. Very carefully take that picture to catch those electrons. You know what I mean? So you get that. <laughs> All right. Today, today's alternator produces more than 100 amps. Usually consists of a cast aluminum case with a spinning magnetized core that can reach speeds of up to 14,000 RPM. This one probably wouldn't spin quite that fast because it's got a bigger pulley on it. A smaller pulley will spin the alternator faster. If you hook up your charging system and you're letting the vehicle idle with the air conditioner, with the blower on high, with the wipers on, with all this kind of stuff, and it's borrowing current, something's going on there. You know what I mean? Like if you're hooking up and you're measuring current flow, if you're seeing it go negative, it'll slowly deplete the battery with somebody cruising around town. You know, that's the problem we used to have to deal with sometimes. Well, it spins a magnetic field through the stationary outer winding called a stator, spinning on the inside of that stator, and there's the stator windings and all that. And that's where the alternating current that gave its name is created, right? Okay, so this right here is what a bunch of rectifier bridges. That one there is one off an old GM style alternator and all these rectifier bridges. I got a rectifier laying up here somewhere that we were looking at the other day. Okay, this is what it looks like when it goes through the rectifier. You got AC that's created. The rectifier puts everything on the top side of that line, right? Alternating currents converted to DC current with a series of diodes. These diodes here wired to the stator and the output of the alternator is constantly controlled by logic circuits in an electronic regulator. And the electronic regulator controls the strength of the field, which is in the spinning rotor. And a stator is where the power is actually created by the magnetism that's spinning inside of it. Um, you might also notice that see these are all hooked to the stator is all, it's got every leg of that stator is hooked to that rectifier. You know, that's just a very simple field strength is controlled based on load. 
Now this is a picture I took right here in the classroom on that old scope I used to have. Uh, this is basically, I, do, I put the zero line there. AC voltage looks like that. You put a rectifier in there, it looks like that. Right? Uh, looks like you did with a spire ground, doesn't it? Uh, the uh, output of the alternator is constantly and consistently controlled by watching. It watches what voltage is there. It's got a target voltage it's shooting for. If it doesn't see its target voltage, it increases the amount of the duty cycle on the that put, creates magnetism in the uh, rotor. All right. And now this. Notice how. You remember. Notice how some alternators have got an external fan and some have an internal fan. Chrysler's put the fan inside the alternator a long time ago. But these right here, that fan is pulled that air through that alternator, really important to keep it cool. And it's not that it doesn't have a fan, you just, it's just harder to see. Uh, space limitations, higher underhood temperature. Furthermore, if you have to get your hand in one of them when it's spinning and I have, it don't feel too good. All right. Some people, some Fords have two alternators on them, and some of these guys that are really Joe Gearheads will stuff all kinds of alternators. I've seen alternators that were lined up with like five alternators. All in one, all in a row. That one there is a kit you can put on there. You just got to snake your belt around another alternator. And basically, when you do it, you just wire them in parallel. You know, they're grounded and they they all go to the battery. It's, it's really not that complicated, all that. But the reason that the six liter had this, two, uh, two 150 amp alternators can produce 300 amps. If you put a 300 amp alternator on there, I've seen those. I've actually worked on them. They're great big, huge things. And they cost a lot of money if you have to replace them. And uh, on the six liter, you know, the alternator don't, uh, you know, one of them doesn't put out until glow plugs are done, you know, because the glow plugs have got an afterglow. So after the engine starts, they glow just a little bit to make sure everything keeps running smooth and keeps the emissions down. So they don't want to overload the glow plugs with too much amperage, so they apparently, so they shut that down if you look up the way that does. Now, this is a standalone system, operates independently of PCM. Uh, the voltage regulator is built uh, in and gets a 12 volt turn on feed through the battery charging system warning light. Comes from here. We've talked about that before. If this is interrupted anywhere, that's why they got a resistor jumping around that light. So if that bulb blows, you'll still have a charging system. See, they don't want the charging system to work because that bulb went away. Uh, although I have seen one that somebody took the, all, took the uh, instrument cluster apart and was going to roll the miles back on a rental car because they want to pay for the extra miles. You know, I'm a smart aleck guy from Fort Rucker. And whenever they brought it to me with the charging system not working, I noticed the that this light wasn't working, and when I got to investigating that, I pulled the instrument cluster out, and he had torn the printed circuit, and it had interrupted that. That's why the charging system wouldn't work. Okay, uh, now the Chrysler started using PCM control for voltage regulation, or actually engine controller. They didn't call them PCM back then. As early as the mid '80s, and you might notice, look at where this junction is. See that? And, uh, you know where? It, make sure you know how the voltage regulates. See, this one does not have a regulator built in. All it's got is the diodes. It's got the field and it's got the, the stator in there. There's no regulator here because the regulator is actually in the powertrain control modules. And the powertrain control module is watching the voltage already. It's really a pretty smart way of doing that. All right, you notice that? This is how it looks on one of those. You got those two little wires right there. You got the big battery terminal. Then eventually, see, it always has to go from whenever you come off there with your big terminal and your battery. It's going to go a lot of times to a junction on the start. You remember when Zach worked on the other day that Nermy had in here? Uh, it wasn't put out because somebody had taken this wire and put it down here. They put it on there instead of here. Probably because it was easier to get to. All right, but uh, whenever it's on the, this wire that's only hot whenever you hit the starter, the alternator couldn't put any juice anywhere. If you're ever checking an alternator system, one of the first things you want to do is you want to check this one and see if it's hot. If that one's not hot, you better find out why. And that's what we did on the one that Nermy had, that Pontiac G6. Checked it, wasn't hot, found out why. Well, I figured maybe it had burned a fuse link, but it didn't. All right, charging system testing is not terribly complicated. It's a good idea to have one of these because if, if you've got an inductive meter like this, and I got one in on my desk in there that's similar to this, except it's yellow, and you can uh, put that thing on there and see how many amps are flowing. All right, you need to be able to measure amps with an inductive probe. It costs $113 at Tooltopia for a really nice little, you know, one like that. It comes with leads too that you plug in here, and you can use it for a voltmeter. Pretty slick. The one that, uh, that uh, General Technologies makes, you know, same people that made that little ignition tester, they make a model that you can hook up to an oscilloscope and it'll give you a scope pattern. You know, in other words, you can hook it up, you can use this right here, hook it up and hook the leads up to an oscilloscope and get a pattern on your, on your scope screen. Uh, they don't advertise that, but because they said it's really, the sample rate's only about 10,000 times per second, that's not really fast enough. You know? 
All right, if you're looking for 14 and a half volt idling, that's usually a target voltage, but the amperage will vary measured with measured battery voltage. If, it's, if it sees a low battery, it's going to have more amperage, right? Disable the fuel ignition system. Do that. Remember this earlier, I told you. Spin it for 15 seconds. It should remain above 9.6 after the battery test. Fire the engine up and watch the alternator output because you've already pulled a pretty good bit out of the battery. Spin it at 15 seconds, you're going to pull some juice out of that battery. And it's going to want to put it back in there. And you're going to see alternator output should be in the 40 to 60 amp range, sometimes a little more than that. You, know, you can very well assume the alternator and battery are healthy. <coughs> there is the full fielding thing. The full field measurement on the alternator's big output wire with the probes there pointing toward the batteries here. So what you do on that uh, forge style alternator, there's a little arrow pointing at this screw that says ground here to test. Take a ground wire, hook it on there, the alternator will put out everything it can put out. One time I worked on a motor home and when you revved it up, it would suddenly start putting out 18 volts. When you let off, it would drop back to normal. And I said, that must be the voltage regulator. I've seen that before. That must be what it is. So I went to the trouble to pull that alternator off, replace the voltage regulator, put it back on, just like it would, just like it would, didn't change the darn thing. Well, what it was, the centrifugal force was causing that thing to full field. As it spun faster, that was what the deal was on that one. I've never seen that, but like once or twice. Uh, generator output studs right there. And on this one right here, it's like on that Chevrolet motor out there that we got on the stand, there's a little D-shaped hole in there and a little test tab where it full fills in there. You can't full fill every alternator, but you can on some, right? Full fill and bypasses the voltage regulator and reveals what the alternator is capable of. You're putting full fill on that rotor. You're giving it full magnetism, all right? If you measure that rotor right there, you ought to see four to six ohms. On these alternators, it's got the Ford regulator with the two exposed screws on the back. If you got sitting on the bench, you can actually go to your with your meter to those two screws, and you ought to read four to six ohms if the brushes are good. Uh, if you look for worn out brushes like that, if brushes wear out uh, over a period of time, uh, measure the rotor where the brushes ride, and look for worn out brushes, which is fairly common. Uh, there's your diode and plate assembly stator. These right here are closely related. Bad connections anywhere in here, or if it's shorted to itself, or if one of these diodes is bad. It's going to cause a, a nasty whining noise. You ever heard an alternator go, you know, like a, it's kind of like a ceiling fan. It's got this resonance that it picks up with this magnetism. Boom, boom, boom. You know, a ceiling fan running like that, it does that. And this is the ripple that you're actually looking at. This is what's going on underneath it. But that ripple right there on your scope screen is what you're talking about. Uh, there's an alternator ripple. The yellow line is a perfect pattern. Basically, that is really an idealistic perfect pattern. This is sort of what you're looking at here. If you see one, and I've, I usually look for one that's just little bumps right across the center of the screen, and if you see one that's just ragged and ugly and all over the screen, I mean, that typically means you got issues. You can push the button on that uh, snap-on tester out there, and it'll tell you sometimes that the diode is bad when it's not. So if I see that thing telling me it's bad, I'm going to hook a scope up, and I'm going to see what that pattern looks like. Uh, so, you know, that's basically, look at that, there's some sample patterns. Now you got more and more alternators now that are having overrun in pulleys. And that has a simple one-way clutch inside the pulley. This one here does. And let the clutch uh, let coast down. In other words, alternator coast down when the engine is shut down. Sometimes if the alternator doesn't coast down, it may chirp the belt or something like that. And that's something that they don't really want doing. You know, sometimes the alternator will free wheel whenever you're doing that. And if these pulleys come apart on the inside, that thing will sound terrible. Uh, we've had to replace some of them, and I cut one of them apart, and I got two sets of springs in that diagonal thing. Uh, it should spin freely in one direction and lock in the other direction, and the service life is about 60,000 miles. You can buy just the pulley from the parts store for about 60 to 70 bucks. Not too hard to change. This particular one right here, you notice that little toothed, um, there's a special tool you're supposed to get to put in that thing to spin it off of there on that. And so this one here, if you pop this uh, uh, cover off, have you ever seen one that's just got a cover on it like that? If you pop that cover off of there, you're going to see a 17 millimeter Allen in there. And that's when you take that little socket up, raise the bolts on, and you can spin it off around like that. And uh, we've had to replace two or three or four of them around here in, in, uh, over time. Uh, question one, a magnetic field can be produced by force of current through an insulated conductor, true or false? Uh, we're going to go through these pretty fast. In a four brush starter, two brush leads will be grounded and two will be insulated. True or false? Commutators are copper strips that connect each brush to loops of wire wound around the solenoid. True or false? What 
normal running clutch free wheels when the speed of the flywheel falls below that of the drive pinion. That true or false? The only purpose of the starter mounted solenoid is to engage the starter drive. According to one principle of electromagnetism, the strength of an electrical field around a conductor can be increased by A, wrapping the conductor into a coil, B, raising the voltage of the current which is flowing through the conductor, C, placing an iron core near the conductor, or D, all of the above. Fender mounted starter solenoid engages the drive gear with the flywheel, true or false? If a technician believes the ground has been lost on a fender mounted starter relay, he or she should confirm this by examining what? Ignition switch, relay mounting bracket, positive battery terminal, or negative battery terminal. Question 9. On starter motors with solenoid shift systems, the drive pinion is forced into engagement with the ring gear teeth by what? Centrifugal force, the neutral safety switch, the shift fork, the starter relay. Finally, the last question. The alternator voltage regulator is A, turned on by the voltage that passes through the battery or charge warning lamp, B, the most expensive part of the charging system, C, usually replaced when a belt is worn out, or D, never fails. And that's the end. Okay. And we'll, what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll grade your test. Uh, huh? Why didn't he never bring a pin? Yes, I did bring a pin. Where is it? Yes, I never bring a pin. Okay. Huh? Huh? Okay. All right. <laughs> he drives up on that. All right, we only got one test. So both of you get the same grade. Okay. Uh, what did you mark on this one? True. Okay. Whoops. What did you mark on that one? True. What did you mark on that one? True. False. Mark that one wrong. What did you mark on that one? Uh, true. False. You got that one wrong. If the speed of the flywheel is slower, the grade's going to grab, I mean, the gear's going to grab and spin it. You know what I'm saying? If the speed, if it picks up speed and gets faster than the starter drive, it's going to activate the overrunning clutch. The only purpose of the starter mounted solenoid is to engage the starter drive. According to one principle of electromagnetism, the strength of electrical field, which one do you get? All the above. All the above. Fender mounted starter solenoid engages the drive gear with the flywheel. False. Technician believes the ground's been lost on a fender mounted starter relay. What should we do? Uh, I put it in the Relay mounting bracket. The ground that this thing gets, the power, the power to it comes in right here from the from the starter through the neutral safety switch, and the ground is right here. It's only got one wire going to it to power it up. It does not have a separate ground wire on that one. And some of these right here actually operate another solenoid on the starter. On starter motors and solenoid shift system, the drive pin is forced to engagement by what? Starter relay. The shift fork, which is right here. That's the shift fork. That's what kicks it in, right? And the alternator voltage regulator is what? A. Turn it on. All right. What'd you make? Uh, Made 60. All right. All right. Trying to prepare you for a final knowledge. Now, let me ask you this. I'll give you guys a choice. Would you rather have your midterm score figured based on your electude or your worksheets? Worksheets. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any electude. <laughs> yeah.